Okay, so today we're going to start a chapter that is really an interesting mix of concepts. Today in this first section, we're going to talk about the Protestant Reformation and also about Christianity going global. And this is something that we kind of touched on a little bit in uh, chapter 13 and also chapter 14 when we were talking about the expansion of the Europeans in particular to the New World and them going and converting the indigenous population of the Americas to primarily Catholicism, but then there's also going to be some of the Protestant sects that will come along a little bit later and start converting people uh, here as well. So as usual, I'll show you what to highlight and I'll give the notes um, where we need to add some extras, and uh, I'm not going to type them in, but I'll be sure to point out where those in particular need to go. So to kind of start off with just a little bit of uh, background information, uh, today more than 60% of Christians live outside of Europe and North America. So Christianity in whatever form it's practiced, whether it's Catholicism or some form of Protestantism, is truly a global religion. And it will be becoming a global religion during this uh, time period as well. And during this time period from 1450 to 1750, out of Europe comes two developments during this early modern period. One, like I said before, a little bit of a spoiler, is, is that Christianity became a global presence. Before, it had been more of a regional faith. It had been in predominantly Eurasia, a little bit into to Northern Africa a little bit, um, but Northern Africa is going to by far be more Islamic. The one Christian nation, I use the term really kind of loosely, is going to be what is now modern day Ethiopia. But we're also going to have Another element of this chapter that that will definitely come and clash with the basic tenets of the faith of Christianity. And this is going to be not just simply the scientific revolution, but it's also going to be the Enlightenment, where the focus for both of these is going to be on the use of logic and reason. So the other thing coming out of Europe is going to be that scientific revolution that I mentioned before, which is going to foster a different approach to the new world. Now, what you want to do here is next to B, underneath number three, you want to put down this note. And again, you can go either on the right margin or on the left margin. It really doesn't necessarily matter. And this isn't going to be a very big note. But you want to put, please, here, both Christianity and scientific thought connected distant people. Both Christianity and scientific thought connected distant people. And with Christianity, that's going to be, you know, a little bit of a no-brainer uh, as Christianity becomes global, where the scientific revolution, um, we're going to have to work at this just a little bit to get you guys to understand it. The Europeans, of course, are going to be central players in these developments. But again, as always, they are not going to act alone. I mean, even though it looks as though the Europeans are movers and shakers, in reality, the people that they are coming into contact with are going to be just as important to the story as the Europeans will be. And again, you know, a big part of this is going to be the people who converted to Christianity. Christianity are going to shape what Christianity looks like in those particular places. You're going to see um, a lot of cultural blending going on here as well. And finally, to finish up this section, uh, science is also going to meet with varying receptions from other regions of the globe. So again, it's not going to only be the all European show. And you want to put down here next to B underneath number four, do you want to put please here that science became part of the definition of global modernity? Science became part of the definition 
of global modernity. And what's going to happen here, and this is going to be something that we'll definitely build upon later, in order to be a modern nation, there is going to have to be an acceptance of science and scientific reason and logic and the technology and just general knowledge that kind of goes and flows along with that. So in the first section here, we are going to globalize Christianity. And in this globalization, we actually are going to have the fragmenting of Christianity. We're going to have the breakdown of the Roman Catholic Church and the creation of the Protestant faith. So in 1500, and I kind of said something about this before, Christianity is going to be mostly limited to Europe. Um, you want to get down here, and this is just a little bit of uh, background information so we can kind of go forward, but you want to put down here next to the unlabeled sentence, the Roman Catholic Church was the oldest, strongest, and richest institution in Europe. The Roman Catholic Church is the only institution to have survived the fall of Rome. And with this age of well more than 1,500 years, it will have grown amazingly influential, uh, very, very powerful, very, very wealthy. Um, and unfortunately, with that age, with that power, with that wealth, is also going to come some corruption. And the reformation that we have is going to be a reaction against that. In general, this is just where the Roman Catholic Church stands at this time. Uh, we're definitely on the defense. Oh, let me fix that here. We're definitely on the defense against Islam. You know, we're not necessarily that far removed from this point to the Crusades. You also have the growth of the Ottoman Empire intruding on uh, the eastern part of Europe and actually even getting into the central part of Europe when the Ottomans go and lay siege to Vienna in 1529. So the Islamic presence is going to be uh, a big deal. And it's going to kind of contribute to the situation that the Roman Catholic Church finds themselves in here as well, uh, leading up to and allowing the Protestant Reformation to go ahead and to take place. So the Protestant Reformation is going to begin in 1517 when Martin Luther goes and posts his 95 theses asking for debate about ecclesiastical abuses. What Luther is basically doing here, and we'll get a note next to A on his number one here in a second, Luther is writing down 95 complaints that he has with the Roman Catholic Church. And the biggest issue for him, and this is the note I want you to put down here next to A, and by the way, this is kind of like a beefier note, and we also have another beefy note that, that will go here with B. So, you know, just a little bit of an FYI. You, want, you might want to go one side of the notes and then go to the other side of the notes for the letter, sorry, for the note. Um, but next to A, you want to put, please, here, the biggest issue was over indulgences. The biggest issue was over indulgences, which were forgiveness from sin. They can be received through prayer, pilgrimage, crusade, or bought. So what ends up happening is, is that the Roman Catholic Church is in need of money. And indulgences, which have always existed, ultimately are going to become kind of like a really great fundraiser. Because if you've committed sin and you want to absolve yourself or get absolution for that sin, why go and spend all of the time to do lengthy 
repetitive prayers, to go on a pilgrimage, which is just simply a long walk to something religiously significant, go on a crusade, which again is a long walk with a weapon to go beat the crap out of somebody else who has a weapon. Why not just simply go and pay for it, especially if you have the cash? And the deal here is, is that Luther isn't necessarily anything new. He's one of many criticisms of the Roman Catholic Church. We have criticisms of the Roman Catholic Church that go well into the medieval period, like well before uh, the 800s. We have another series of complaints and reforms within the Catholic Church that are going to be in the 13th and the 14th century. So Luther isn't necessarily anything new. And Luther's process, sorry, protests rather, one of the little differences here is, is that his protests are going to be more deeply grounded in theological difference. The big one here is that he questions the special role of the clerical hierarchy, including the Pope. And this we need to put a note down. And in fact, this note, you want to put a star by it, because this is going to be the big deal here. So the note that you want to put down is this idea was revolutionary. This idea was revolutionary. And again, you want to put a star or two by it because this is going to be one of the things that really gets Luther into a lot of trouble with the Roman Catholic Church. Now, keep in mind, your notes are a little bit different than mine. Um, so up at the top of page two, you want to put, please, because these are going to be some key ideas that we're going to build off of and have a little bit later. You want to put down, please, that Luther also taught, and you're putting this up at the top of page two, of your page two, Luther also taught a new understanding of salvation through faith alone rather than through good works and that the Bible not church teaching is the ultimate authority. Luther's basic idea here just kind of, you know, the base of it is the fact that the Bible is the true word of God. And if someone wants to receive the true word of God, they don't need some cleric. They don't need some priest, some bishop, some cardinal, some pope to interpret that word of God for them, but rather that they can read the Bible and directly get the word of God. So because you you can read and interpret the Bible for yourself, Luther argues that you don't need any member of the clerical hierarchy. You can just simply get rid of them and have faith alone and self-interpretation of the Bible. Luther's ideas, of course, are going to provoke a massive schism or a massive divide within Catholic Christendom. Now, the catch here is going to be, and we'll get into this here, I think, a little bit later, is that Luther didn't intend to separate from the church. He just wants to reform the church. He believes that the church has lost their way, has kind of gotten off their path a little bit, and he wants to reform them, or he wants them to reform, hence his movement being called the Reformation, that he wants them to get back on the right track. And this isn't anything new. We've had earlier reform movements um, that have called the church's corruption or the church's misdeeds into question and have worked to try to get the Roman Catholic Church back on, at least what the reformers see, to be the right path. And Luther is going to attempt to do kind of fairly similar things. 
Now, Luther's ideas will feed on the political, economic, and social tensions, not just simply the religious differences, although there will be some problems with this later on. Some monarchs will use Luther to justify independence from the papacy. But now, here's the thing. They're not necessarily doing this for religious reasons. These guys have massive ulterior motives. So next to B here, underneath number two, you want to put, please, that they would then claim, they would then claim the church land as their own. So if they get rid of the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, by the way, is the single largest landholder in all of Europe. These monarchs go and they kick out the Roman Catholic Church. Well, there's all this church land that these monarchs will greedily gobble up and claim it as their own. And remember, land equals wealth and power. So this gobbling up of the former church land is going to increase their power in their country. It's also going to increase their wealth. And on top of this, because the Roman Catholic Church was so politically influential, you're going to have multiple religious leaders like cardinals and bishops operating as these monarchs' advisors and kind of interfering sometimes within the working of the government. If they get rid of the church, these monarchs no longer have to deal with that interference. Commoners are also going to be attracted to these new religious ideals as a tool for protest against the whole social order. Now, here's going to be the catch. And you want to put this note down here next to D, underneath number two. In the 1520s, there are German peasant revolts that Luther did not support. What happens in the 1520s is, is that you have these German peasants who use the words of Luther to attempt to launch a social revolution. They use his words to attempt to throw off or destroy the established social structure. And to be honest with you, the established political structure where the peasants are at the bottom. Luther comes out against these revolts and he basically says, no, 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 my ideas are simply religious. Uh, they're not political. They're not social. Um, if you want to attain the next step, then you just simply need to be a good Christian. But at the end of the day, you know, whatever your social standing is, your lot in life. And I'm not supporting any type of a revolution that's going on here. Now, there are going to be a lot of women that will be attracted to Protestantism, but at the end of the day, the Reformation just simply didn't give them a greater role within church or society. Because within Protestantism, you don't have the honoring of the saints, you also don't have the honoring or veneration of the Virgin Mary. So women's position as people of honor, people to kind of worship, people to venerate is going to be lost within the Protestant Reformation. Protestants also closed convents, which by the way is where you get nuns, which gave women some alternative to marriage. At this point, if women didn't want to marry, if you're a Catholic woman, the alternative is, well, you just become a nun and you join a convent. Well, since the Protestants don't have monks or nuns, that option is taken away. So there's no alternative to marriage. If you don't want to marry, suck it up, buttercup. You're still going to end up having to get married. It does, bigger picture, and this is going to be big for us going forward as well, there is some increase in education of women because of the emphasis on Bible reading. In general, and you want to put this note here next to D underneath number three, um, but there was little use for education beyond the family. 
In general, what you will see, and I started to say this, in general, what you will see in Protestant nations are higher literacy rates. Because in order to receive the word of God, you have to be able to read the Bible. You also have Bibles being printed more frequently and also being printed in languages other than Latin. In order for someone to read Latin, you have to have a formal education. And there's a massively huge number that simply aren't able to go ahead uh, and do that. What helps the Reformation to really kick off is going to be this invention of the printing press. And you want to put a big star here by number four, because this is a really, really big deal. Um, Without the printing press, you don't have Luther's ideas expanding outside of his immediate little community. As the Reformation spreads, it will splinter into an array of competing Protestant churches. Luther's church, Lutheranism is going to be the oldest, but you'll also see some, you also see Calvinists, you'll see Methodists, you'll see Presbyterians, you'll see Anabaptists. There will be tons and tons of variations on uh, Luther's message. The catch here is going to be that the religious differences that are popping up in Europe are going to cause another level of problems. It's going to make Europe's fractured political system even more volatile because this is going to be another difference. Not only are these guys already amazingly competitive with one another, but now you add religious difference that's going to be very deeply felt and it's going to ultimately end in conflict where we have the French wars of religion, where they're Catholics versus Huguenot. Huguenot, by the way, are French Calvinists. And then all of these conflict is going to end with something known as the Thirty Years' War. Now, the catch with the Thirty Years' War, and you want to put this down here next to B, underneath number six. Do you want to put, please, here, that it's fought over both political and religious reasons. It's fought over both political and religious reasons. And to be honest with you, the French wars of religion are also going to have some political issues kind of molded in here as well. So even though these are wars of religion, religion isn't going to be the only issue at hand with any of uh, these conflicts. The Protestant Reformation will then in turn provoke something known as a Catholic Counter-Reformation. And here there's a couple different things going on. We have the Council of Trent that's going to clarify church doctrines and practices. It's called to kind of rectify the problems that Luther points out in his 95 Theses. What the Council of Trent ends up doing is just simply reaffirming Catholic doctrine. They do correct some of the abuses and corruption, where we have a new emphasis placed on education and the supervision of the priests. There's also a crackdown on dissidents. And what's happening here with D, and I need you to put this little note in next to number seven, is this brought about the inquisitions. This brought about the inquisitions. Now, This is kind of for some, a second round of inquisitions, but they're trying to get rid of any, for lack of a better idea, any error messages within the Catholic dogma, within the Catholic message. And they're just going to get rid of that, you know, relatively violently. We also, out of this, we see new religious orders. The Society of Jesus, better known as the Jesuits, were committed to renewal and expansion. These Jesuits here are, I like to liken them to the Pope's holy rollers. These guys are, and we'll come back to them in a little bit. These guys are amazingly well-educated in not just simply Catholic doctrine, but they are going to be amazing mathematicians, scientists, and they're going to be the ones that are going to come into the area if there's any kind of off message 
issues and you don't necessarily want to see them because it probably means that there's an inquisition coming to a town or a village near you. The religious reformation is also going to encourage skepticism towards authority and tradition. You want to go ahead and put a star by eight because this is going to be big once we get into the scientific revolution. And we'll kind of talk a little bit more about that later, but people are actively starting to question, especially the Roman Catholic Church, but also the Bible as the sole source of all information and truth. And since we're questioning the word of the church, why not go and question all other or just in general other elements of the church and also uh, the Catholic faith here as well. And it's also going to foster religious individualism, which again, we'll kind of deal with this uh, a little bit later here uh, as well. As soon as we have the Reformation, and even in the years leading up to the Reformation, we start to have Christianity going outward. You want to put a, you want to go ahead and put a star here uh, by capital B. I mean, one, and in some of this, like I said, we've already gone over here. Christianity is motivated and benefited from European expansion. Remember, one of the three Gs, one of the three motivators of the early explorers is God, glory, and gold. Again, they want to convert as many people as they possibly can. In fact, the Spaniards and the Portuguese saw overseas expansion as a continuation of the crusading tradition. Remember, they want to, at least initially, they want to gather more souls to Christianity so they can, in future, potentially duke it out with the Muslims. Where now, since we have a division within Christianity, the Catholic hope is, is that we can win the numbers game against the Protestants Protestants by just simply having more Catholics. So these early explorers are going to combine religious and material interests. And because this is important motivator for the explorers, you want to go ahead and put a star there by B underneath number one. Imperialism or colonialism is what made the globalization of Christianity possible. So you want to go and put another star here by number two. Without the Europeans getting out of Europe and going to and discovering a new world, Christianity would remain technically a regional religion. Because with colonization or imperialism, settlers and traders are going to bring their religion with them. Missionaries, which at this time are going to be mostly Catholic, are going to actively spread Christianity. Remember, we're converting the indigenous population of the Americas. And it's going to be in the Americas and also in the Philippines where missionaries are going to be most successful. And one of the reasons why they're most successful is going to be the fact that they are in a defeated society. So the Europeans are going to have a pretty easy hand with this. But you want to put a note down here next to C, underneath number two, that Confucians, Buddhists, Hindus, and Muslims resisted Christianity much more. Just point blank, Christianity, specifically Catholicism, is not going to be successful in any place that already has a literate world religion. So these places that already have Confucianism, have Buddhism, have Hinduism, or have Islam, you're not going to see big numbers of conversion, if any numbers of conversion, where these places in Spanish America and the Philippines, because they're not literate and they don't have these literate world religions, and there are conquered people, uh, Christianity is going to be very, very successful in those particular areas. In Spanish America, and this kind of leads into what I was just saying, the process of population collapse, conquest, and resettlement made Native Americans receptive to the conquered religion. The Europeans specifically are going to case, sorry, are, claim some exclusive religious truth and try to destroy re 
traditional religion instead of accommodating them. So early on, conversion is really, you know, smash and bash, that we will kind of beat you into submission. However, as time goes on, we're going to start to see the blending of the two religious traditions being far more common, where local gods are going to remain influential. You also have the Catholic Church going and creating these new saints that are specific to the new colonies in the new world that are going to have a lot of similarities with some of the old Aztec Incan gods and goddesses. We just simply are going to change their names to make them more Christian and less indigenous. You also have some societies like, for example, the Incans, that as they're taking on some of the images of Catholicism, will kind of throw in some of their old school images as well, where you kind of have the blending of the two. Like, for example, um, the Incan nobility and royalty will be denoted by wearing this specific red type of fringe on their forehead. Well, what the native Peruvians do is they start to adorn, they start to put this red fringe on statues and images of Jesus Christ to kind of blend with the old school Incan ideas and these new forced upon them Catholic ideas. We will attempt to expand into China where Christianity is going to be reaching China at its really its most powerful during this period, during the Ming and uh, the Qin dynasty. Because the Chinese are so much stronger than the Europeans, this is going to call for the Catholics to do a slightly different missionary strategy where they need government permission to operate. And specifically, rather than converting the masses like they do in uh, the New World or in the Philippines, the Jesuits are going to be brought in and they're going to specifically target the official Chinese elite. Next to B here, underneath number one, you want to put down here that they were respectful of Chinese culture and tried to accommodate it. This is the exact opposite of what they do in the New World, where they will destroy local religion and culture. But because the power structure is different here in China, they're not going to be able to force themselves in. So instead, they kind of have to work the margins a little bit. They have to try to show commonalities. They have to try to be, uh, be deferent, to kind of show their submission to the Chinese culture. At the end of the day, because China does have literate philosophies, there's going to be no mass conversion in China. You want to also go ahead and put a star here uh, by number two. I mean, you do have some scholars and officials being converted. Um, the Jesuits are going to be appreciated for their mathematical, astronomical, technological, and cartographical skills. So these other skill sets, that these Jesuits have beyond their religious knowledge, the Chinese are like, hey, we're interested in that. We don't want to talk about religion. We really don't want any of that stuff coming from you. However, this other information that you have really intrigues us. One of the other issues here that made, or one of the other two issues that made Christianity not very appealing is the missionaries didn't have much to offer that the Chinese needed. And you want to go ahead and put a star there by number three. The Jesuits aren't coming in with any special answers to, you know, why do we exist? How did we get here? What happens to after, what happens to us after we die? Because Chinese philosophies already fill that void. There's no for lack of a better idea, unanswerable questions that all of a sudden the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church come in with answers to. On top of that, and this is probably the bigger, 
is that Christianity was unappealing because it was an all or nothing religion that called for the rejection of much of Chinese culture. You want to go ahead and put a star also there by A underneath number three. So in the Catholic point of view at this point, you need to be religiously monogamous. You have to be Catholic or nothing. You have to be some sect, some branch of Christianity or nothing. Where in China, you can practice multiple philosophies and not be lesser in the practicing of any of those philosophies. Like you can practice Buddhism and Taoism and practicing both of those won't make you less of a Buddhist or less of a Taoist. Where with the Catholics, or, and with Christianity in general, you have to have soul faith in Christianity. You can't intermix anything. 